Good afternoon, everybody. Today's lecture is on random matrix theory. Before I begin, uh, is this visible to you? Someone call up? Yes, sir. Yes, it is visible. Thank you very much. Okay. So basically, random matrix theory was developed uh, because there was a desire to understand the spectra of uh, large complex nuclei. So it was for complex spectra of large nuclei that people developed random matrix theory. It has, one could actually use it and borrow that formalism over into condensed matter physics and into the disordered systems. And that is what we will attempt to do but I have to tell you what this random matrix theory is about. When you do disordered systems, you are lost. You are lost in the sense that you have a stochastic system. But even worse, you have a stochastic quantum system. And you don't really know how to go about it. So in a sense, you are stabbing in the dark. And uh, and the matrix theory was one such stab that we are making, uh, that we should be making to see if we have some success in understanding the order systems. Uh, the theory was, I think, to the best of my knowledge, there is an iconic paper by Wigner on this. So Wigner, 1958. I think he wrote one of the important papers in his field. And then it was developed further by a slew of absolutely first rate theoreticians, first rate mathematical physicists, like the names of people like Dyson, Meta, Rosenzweig, Gorin uh, are associated with the random matrix theory. So it's a forbidding series of names because all of them are, how should I say, very high power theoreticians. Uh, and what we will try to do today is do something modest. We will try to understand this theory in the context of what we know by taking a simple example, which can be generalized by the way, it can be easily be generalized. Okay, so you have people like Wigner, you have Dyson, Meta. Both from Princeton at that time, Madan Lal Mehta, who then went on to France, Rosen uh, Godin, another French theoretician, etc. So we have a who's who of the uh, top notch abstract theoretical physics working in this field. What we will do to understand random matrix theory and to make some connection with which is of interest to us is to think instead of uh, to think instead, don't think in terms of a complex nuclei or a many body complex uh, a nuclear problem you know, with lots of protons and uh, neutrons and isospin and what have you okay, and strong interactions and human interactions, etc. But uh, you think in terms of, say, a random collection of diatomic molecules. So we, we try to understand it in terms of what I would call as a random collection Or in figures of the molecular solid, if you would like to think, if I would try to give this word, and try to see how uh, to understand the electronic structure of diatomic molecules, in which, let's say there is only one orbital per site, so in which these orbitals' energies can take random values. So, what you are essentially thinking of, and let me take a white job. 
uh, what you are essentially thinking of is say there is a, a cation, okay, there is an anion with energy epsilon in it. And when you bring the cation and anion together, say like gallium arsenide, gallium is the cation, arsenic is the anion, then the band is, then they actually, these two levels split or you know, rearrange themselves to give you a uh, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital and the highest occupied molecular orbital. So they give you two levels, which then this LUMO and HUMO then become what this band gap for an infinite solid. So take the average level over here, and what you would have is that these levels will split, and you would get something like this. Something here. So this would be the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. This would be the highest occupied molecular orbital. And I'm sure you have done this in your solid state course. Okay. So they, they split into this. Then the distance steps between these two, okay, this is the lumo homo gap, or it's sometimes called the band gap. This is the gap. How does one get this? How does one get this picture from uh, uh, from this uh, cation and anion? You write down the matrix. You get it. You have a two by two matrix. Uh, you would write it like this if I'm not mistaken. E, and then you'd have say minus v two minus v two is what is called the covalency term, which links the anion to the cation. Okay. And you have a two by two matrix. So your quantum mechanical problem is very simple. And you try to diagonalize it. If you diagonalize it, you get two levels. A bonding level and an anti-bonding level. This is the bonding level. This is the homo level. That we call as EB. This would be the anti-bonding level. This would be a silent anti-bonding. I hope this is clear. Anti-bonding. So you have bonding and anti-bonding. So, say the anti bonding would be epsilon bar plus square root of uh, V3 square plus V2 square, and the anti bond and the, uh, the anti bonding, and the bonding would be epsilon bar minus square root of V3 square plus V2 square. These are the two letters the bonding and the anti bonding. The homo and the lumo. You might say, pray, what is this epsilon bar and what is this V3? Uh, V2, of course, is the covalency term. The epsilon bar is the average of the anion orbital, a level and the cation level. This is the average. This is EC plus EA by 2. And what is this V3? V3 is called the polarity term. V3 is nothing but epsilon c minus epsilon a by let us say or it could be the other way around but it's one or the other this is the square term it doesn't matter if i take ec minus ea or ea minus ec so this is what it is. right so this is this measures the polarity of the system if it's a totally poor uh, homopolar molecule EC is equal to EA. <coughs> You'd still get a bad gap because the V3 is zero but not the V2. Okay. This is the average value. Uh, I'm not going through this algebra. I think you're familiar with it, but you can remind yourself about it later in the evening. Okay. So now, now what is the question? What is this random matrix theory all about? Random matrix theory will say that. As far as epsilon C and epsilon A in this V2 are concerned, these matrix elements are random. So you have a probability distribution of epsilon C. You have another probability distribution, say, I can call it something else, let me call it C. Another one, say, A for epsilon A. And you have a probability distribution, let me call it, uh, what is it, call it? V2, okay, 2. Each one of them uh, can change 
uh, perhaps independently of each other, supposing they are uncorrelated, okay, they would change, and uh, therefore this matrix is actually not, uh, it's basically a whole ensemble of matrices. And you want to interest the question, what would be this homo lumo gap? What I'm interested in is the following. I'm interested in, okay, I'm putting a big question mark, if there's a probability distribution here, a probability distribution here, a probability distribution here, I'm interested in what is the probability distribution of something called epsilon, which is epsilon AB minus epsilon. How does that work? How does the homo gap work? So there are a number of questions that have now come up, okay, and you know, and addressed very beautifully by Wigner in his first paper. First of all, what are these probability distributions? How do I get them? How do I argue for them in a cogent, transparent, believable way? That is one question. The second question is, given this, how do I arrive at this? Wigner actually addressed both these questions and he came across a very simple answer and you know in random matrix theory it's supposed to be uh, one that is well known now but it was not until people discovered it in the late 50s and 60s that the probability distribution for this gap would go as by the way they never call it a gap this gap is my word i'm calling it a gap okay because i would like to make it relevant to make a doctor of physics or condensed matter physics so this gap would go like, would go in epsilon e raised to minus epsilon squared. This is how it would scale. And I'm not paying attention to dimensional correctness or something. This is how the, this is how the probability distribution of this gap. Which means that there's an epsilon here, there's an epsilon square here. This epsilon is positive note. Okay, anti-bonding is above the bonding. If I were to plot this, what I would get is nothing on the left side, nothing on the negative side, you get something like this. Okay, I get 3 epsilon versus epsilon. So the gap is not zero. Okay. The average gap is not going to be zero. The average of this could very well be zero. And this maybe could very well be zero, and this could be zero too. But this is not zero. There's a finite gap, okay. There's a maxima over here, huh? and we will see what that maxima is. So this is the program. I will tell you how to get all this. How do we go about arguing for what is now known as the Wigner distribution? Or sometimes in a very uh, how should I say uh, how should I say a very correct way or very frightening way you would like to say this sometimes it's called the distribution for a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. G intimidating I would call it. that's the word I was looking for. This is called a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. How do I get this? But so this is as far as the introduction goes. So let me start with the formula. And before I do, uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Yes, uh, this is John. Uh, uh, so I, I couldn't get why there's a probability distribution P of epsilon A and P of epsilon C and P of epsilon B2. Why is there this probability distribution? Yes. Because you have a random collection of molecules. Okay, so are we trying to form a two by two matrix of the similar form or? That we will see what we are trying to do. Okay. And what is captured? All that I am saying is you have a collection of nuclei, say. Okay. You don't, have, you don't do experiment on one nuclei. No? You do a collection, you do an experiment on a large number of nuclei. Okay. And each nuclei could be slightly different from the other, even though they are all uranium. Similarly, you have a large, large collection of, say, Diatomic molecules. I don't do an experiment on one molecule. I will get no, no signal. It will be so weak. I won't get it. So I try to do it on a large collection of them. Okay. 
and let's say they are disordered. Disordered in the sense that each one of them will have a variation in this cation, cation energy, in the anion energy, and in the covalency term, or the hopping term, as it is called. It is called the hopping term, or the transfer term. Okay. And if that is the case, what can I say about the average? And if I do an optical experiment, supposing I do an optical experiment where I try to prove this gap, okay, then what would be what would I expect? Okay, sir, this Chandra Shekhar. Yes. Uh, so this probability distribution is arising because of the interaction because we are taking a lot of a uh, lot of them together or is it inherent inherent to each of those nuclei so independently arises because of a large number of random factors that can happen we don't care what they are okay we okay. don't know what they are i would like to make all of them the same you know like you think in terms of the uh, on canonical ensemble of so a large number of similar systems but there's no such thing in real life okay hmm. Is some slight perturbation for one, which is not present for the other, and my experiment is on a collection of samples. Okay. okay. Any other questions? So this is Pratyush. Yes. Uh, uh, what is the relevance of V three? What V three? The V three that is E C minus E A by two. What does it uh, represent? It's called the co the polarity term. It actually tells you how different one atom in that diatomic molecule is different from the other. So if you had something like silicon silicon or H two hydrogen atom, okay, then E C would be equal to E A and the polarity is zero. If you have something like sodium chloride, okay, so the sodium is basically the, the cation, the chlorine is the anion. And there will be a large difference between the two. So it's the measure of the difference between the two constituents of a diatomic molecule, and it is called polarity. Thank you, sir. Welcome. So the introduction is over. This was basically I presented the introduction. introduction. We first find out what should be the distribution of the matrix elements. Let me begin with a two by two matrix. This is my two by two matrix. H one one, H one two, H two one, H two two. We start with a two by two matrix, and we postulate certain. First, say that the distribution of the matrix elements. And by the way, uh, we begin with this. The H is. It's a real matrix. So these are all real numbers, and it's a symmetric matrix. Because if it is a certainly quantum mechanics would demand that you deal with the Hermitian matrix. That if the matrix is real, then it is symmetric. It's a real symmetric matrix. Then we say, and you know this is actually very beautiful because with a set of two very simple postulates. I'm going to get a very far-reaching result. So I make just two simple postulates. One is that the matrix elements of these 
are uncorrelated. They are distributed, of course, but how this changes vis-a-vis -vis this is the, they are independent distributions. So I say my probability distribution for the matrix H, which is strictly speaking, I should write as P, H11, H12, H22, okay, is equal to P, H11, P, H12, It is uncorrelated. Note, no condition is put that distribution is going to be the same as this. This is P11. This could be different from this. It could be different from this. So that is why. This is number one. The second postulate, so I'm going to postulate this. The second postulate is that these probability distribution is invariant under an orthogonal transform. You can say unitary transform if it was permission, but if I make an orthogonal transform, if I rotate my system, the probability distribution should not change. So I'm demanding demand invariance under unitary class. I say unitary to make it general. This is for a permission matrix or a complex matrix. Since I have a real matrix, okay, then it is invariant. I demand invariance, okay, for this would reduce to what you call as orthogonality. Under rotation, okay. and the rationale for that is not far to seek. Okay, after all, I have written this in a certain basis. If I rotate the basis, okay. There is no need to write it like that. I've done it like anything else. And there should have been no reason for these probability distributions to be different. So demand invariance of what? Demand invariance of I forgot to it. Of pH. Forgot that. That is the invariance I demand. Now what does that mean? It means that if I rotate my matrix, what is the rotation matrix? A rotation matrix, supposing I rotate something by an angle, okay, by angle, by small angle, let's let's use small angle. Supposing I rotate something by a small angle there. Okay. So the rotation matrix, which I can write as O, sometimes you know, it's like the fancy way or orthogonal, would be cos delta. Minus sine delta, sine delta, cos delta. That would be a relation. And therefore, my, let us see, uh, my, I should demand invariance uh, under the transformation O transpose H O. How does the H transform, the H transform, this O transpose H O, then this is just the rotation matrix. Is this clear? Okay. So I just have to put this, stick this in. Since delta is small, I need to examine my, let me call this H prime. I need to examine this H prime is equal to H11 prime, H12 prime, H21, this is also 12 prime, H22 prime. That is what the right hand side is. What about the what about this left hand side? Delta is small note. So cos delta is one, sine delta is delta. 
So I will simply get delta. I'm sorry, one. Uh, this will become delta minus delta. And uh, one minus delta. delta. This is what I mean. So if I want a matrix element H11 prime, I need to do this algebra. And that is easily done. So this product, if you were to take it, you would be you would land up with a term like that, to first order, not to second order. There's a first order term, and that's what you would get. This is my H11 prime. So my H11 prime. What is my H11 prime? It is this. So let me just put it in yellow over here. What is this quantity? This quantity is H11 prime. What is this quantity? H one two prime and so on and so forth. Okay, this would be H two two. Now you do with the set of simple examples. Let's see how far you can go. You you sort of impose the fact that the probability distribution is invariant. Therefore, my P of H. Okay. I will demand. Uh, is equal to P of H prime. And we just basically P H11 plus 2 delta H12 P12 H12 uh, plus delta H22 minus H11 and P22 two two, H22 two two, minus 2 delta, it's minus or plus, minus 2 delta H22 two two, uh, minus uh, H1, sorry. And what is P of H? P of H is nothing but P H11, P H12, P H22. So I demand invariance, it means I make this equal to this. And since delta is small, please allow me to make a chain of expansion. I do a Taylor expansion of this quantity. I'll just do a couple of terms to show you how it goes. It's P11, H11. That's 2 delta H12 into P DP11 over DH11. This is what you get. For the first term, you simply get a term which is the first derivative of P11. For the second term, you will get P12. Let me make H12 
plus delta H22 minus H11. And uh, again, the derivative again, dP12 by dH. And similarly for this term. You then open it out and see what will happen. So I just pause, I'll pause for a minute, but first I should point out something. I have a term like P11 into P12 into P22. That will cancel with what you have over here. Because I have demanded invariance. Okay. So this term cancels with the very first term of this product. What are you left with? Then you are left with a term such as this, which is a delta multiplying P12 and P22. Okay. I will not take a higher order term, I won't take a delta squared term. Okay. Plus, you will be left with a term such as this, which will multiply this P11 and this P22. You will be left with about three other terms, okay, which should be zero. Okay, because the first term is going to get equated to this. I'll just pause for a minute so that you soak this in or maybe you can expand it out right now, okay, for yourself. Because I will write down the expression. Then you'll accept that there is a minus sign here. Well, after all, I have a minus sign. This is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, if you are not comfortable with this, you simply have to work out, you'll get only these terms to second, to first order in depth and no more. So we continue. I mean, uh, now it is very, very clear what I'm going to do. If there's something equal to zero, okay, what I do is I divide everything over here, and please pay attention, by h2 minus h11 divided by h12. So what I will be left for this term is thus H12, okay, DP12, DH12, okay, and this term depends only on the matrix element 1, 2. The others on the other hand will depend on 1, 1 and 2, 2. So if I have two terms, one depending only on the function of x and another depending only on the function of y, 
and if I say f of x plus g of y equal to zero, okay, then I would certainly have g y's. Uh, you know, each one of them goes to a constant. Each of them is a zero, in fact. Okay. So that is all that I will do, and I will get. And if it allow me, uh, I don't want to make a mistake in this. So let's wait. I have one over h minus two. That is this term, because I'm dividing by this. Once again, to repeat what may be obvious to some of you, if this entire thing is zero, okay, then I have I take this term on one side and take these two terms on the other side. And since this depends only on twos and ones, and this depends on one two, this it must be a constant. Each one of them is a constant. Otherwise, a variable of x minus equal to minus g y doesn't make sense. Just as you do it, say when you do the separation of variables. You know, when you try to arrive at the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom in terms of r theta phi, you do a separation of variables of this type. You use the same argument. So I have this. Now it is very clear that at least this term, I will get a very clear handle on because I have nothing but dp12 by p12 is equal to minus c, uh, what is it, dh12. So H12 into D. I can integrate this very simply to get that P12 H12 So C is a constant, but I will posit that the C is a positive constant because I want to, it's a probability distribution. If I to actually make this integrate this h12 from minus infinity to plus infinity and make it equal to a constant like one okay i would simply get that c has to be positive there has to be this negative side and c has to be positive and i would simply get that c this is equal to c 1 2 5 